Good uh, afternoon by, by one minute, and welcome to what is the third in uh, the 2008 uh, Summer Lecture Series presented by the Communications Department of the Lab. Today we're going to be hearing from Wim Lehmans on a topic that is uh, so futuristic uh, that to me anyway it's more exciting than science fiction. But before I uh, introduce Dr. Lehmans, I uh, do have some housekeeping things. Uh, th the main thing is that uh, sometimes people that come in late, uh, they don't want to uh, interrupt people, so they sit in the aisle, and that's liable to get us shut down by the fire marshal. So if somebody sits next to you, make them uh, move in or take one of these empty seats up here. They also don't like to sit in the front row, but, you know, there's good seats down here. Um, we also will have a question and answer uh, period afterwards, and uh, in order to get your questions recorded on the videotape, we hope you'll uh, wait until I bring you a microphone. And if uh, there's anybody in the audience that wants to help me and carry one of these microphones on the other aisle, I'd be delighted uh, after, uh, after we start that uh, uh, question and answer period. And uh, remember that next week we're going to be hearing from uh, Roger Falcone. He's going to talk on new directions in X-ray light sources, which is um, also about accelerators, but it's a very different uh, approach from the one you're going to be hearing about today which uh, leads me to uh, the honor of introducing Wim Lehmans, uh, who will speak on laser wake field acceleration. And, uh, uh, and that, that particular technique uh, has already achieved um, high quality electron beams in, of a billion electron volts in uh, just a few centimeters. Uh, and it promises uh, much greater energies in the future, which I hope we'll hear a little bit about. Uh, Dr. Lehmans earned his undergraduate degrees from the Free University of Brussels in Belgium, and uh, he got his MH, uh, pardon me, his MS and his PhD um, uh, jointly in electrical engineering and plasma physics at UCLA, which uh, apparently was where uh, laser wake field acceleration really got its start uh, back in the, in the early 90s. In 1991, he joined Berkeley Lab's uh, Accelerator and Fusion Research Division, and in just three short years, he had started the LOASIS group. I'm not going to tell you what that means. I think uh, Wim will do that for us in a minute. Uh, but the L stands for laser, and the O stands for optical, and the A stands for accelerator. That far I got. <laughs> um, that is now an independent program in AFRD, and uh, uh, Wim heads that program. He's also an adjunct professor of physics at the University of Nevada in Reno, which I guess introduces some uncertainty in your life, huh? <laughs> being in Reno. Uh, he has won numerous awards, which include the American Physical Society Simon Ramo Award for his, uh, for his thesis, which was on plasma physics, and the 2005 U.S. Particle Accelerator School Prize for Achievement in Accelerator Physics and Technology. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, and he's the current chair of the International Committee for Future Accelerators, <clears throat> the panel on advanced and novel accelerators. The LOASIS program itself has won some awards, including uh, Nature Magazine's Top 10 Discoveries of the Year, and it holds the world's record for laser wake field acceleration, which we'll hear about right now. Here, it's a pleasure to introduce Wim Lehmans. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, it's great to see such an audience still interested in accelerators at this lab. Um, so let me start um, with this picture here. This, of course, is the founder of our lab. And back in 1929, he was holding a little accelerator in his hand. And now, about 80 years later, accelerator science has developed a machine that's sort of the size of a small country, at least a small European country, uh, which can store beams with up to 300 megajoules of stored energy. It's really an incredible machine. And the question is, what will we do in the next 80 years? So if you look at this machine a little bit more in detail, this is the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. It's a 14 tera electron volt, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit what all these T's and P's uh, mean, uh, what this energy means. But it's a proton collider, which has about 27 kilometers circumference, and it's a huge machine. And it's uh, 27 kilometers for various reasons. One is that you, you want to 
bend these particles very gently, but also because conventional accelerators have fields with which they accelerate, accelerate these particles, which are typically 10 to 100 million volts per meter. And as I'll tell you about in our, the technology that we're working on, we achieve about 1,000 times larger electric fields. Now, to get the same particle energy, if you, um, if you have 1,000 times bigger fields, you can do everything in a 1,000 times smaller scale. And so the question that we are trying to answer is, is this doable? Will the machines really be smaller? Will they be cheaper? So that's, a, that's the big question. Our field, as Paul said, we did get the cover of Nature in 2004. This was part of the PhD work of one of our students, uh, who's now on the staff, Cameron Geddes. We also were mentioned on the cover of Nature Physics with our GEV results, and then there was sort of a summary article in Scientific American. And The Economist picked up our article here in Nature Physics on this GEV accelerator, and the journalist called it the light fantastic, a way of building particle accelerators on a tabletop. And at the end of this article, he asked the question, could this technology save particle physics from the clutches of the accountants? And so that's sort of the big question. Now, if you didn't read any of these articles or magazines, maybe you're a movie buff. And I found this here. <laughs> so this is Dr. Evil from the Awesome Power series. And I think he's a little bit jealous of us because he says, and then they fired the laser in the plasma to do this thing called laser wake field accelerator. I think he's jealous that he doesn't have one because it's pretty cool stuff. So how does it work? For those that are biologists, no, I'm not going to talk about this type of plasma, the blood plasma. It's not it. <laughs> so it's really the laser plasma wake field accelerator. So if you're not familiar with plasma, uh, being a plasma physicist, I was always very proud that it was 99% of the universe. Now, of course, it turns out that's just a fraction of what's really out there. Um, but I found a website where some Hardcore plasma physicist still says even the invisible is probably plasma, plasma. So, but we have it in the sun. We have it in discharges. We have it in neon lights. I, I picked this shot from Brussels in Belgium. I don't know why, but these are the neon lights. You have it in tokamaks. You have it in whole realms in, in about 40 miles away from us at Livermore. They're doing ex experiments on this physics here. And then this is our favorite little hydrogen plasma, which I will talk about. So this is the ionized gas, consists of electrons and ions, and we shoot a laser into it. So what's the basic concept? The basic concept was indeed started at UCLA back in 1979 by a paper by Toshi Tajima and John Dawson, and it's really a Southern California idea if you think about it. It's a motorboat. If you think about a motorboat on a lake, and you look behind this motorboat, this motorboat has a nice wake behind it. If you would be a surfer and you're paddling along, you could actually ride that wake and get accelerated. So by analogy, what we do is we replace this motorboat by a laser pulse, a very intense laser pulse, and we shoot it into this plasma, this ionized gas. What happens is when this laser pulse snow plows through the plasma, it pushes the light particles, which are one of the con constituents of this plasma, out of the way, like a snowplow or like this motorboat. It, it displaces this electron fluid, we call it, and it's leaving all the ions behind. And the ions are so heavy on the time scale that this push occurs that they're really sort of immobile. But these electrons get blown out, and when you separate electrons from ions, you set up an electric field. And that's an electrostatic field that co-propagates with this laser pulse right behind it at sort of the velocity of this laser pulse, much like the wake behind the motorboat. And what's neat about it is that when you look at the electric field strengths that you can excite in this, they scale like the density of this plasma. And if we say we produce a spark in air, you have atmospheric density plasma, something like 310 to the 19th electrons per cubic centimeter. You can generate fields by this charge separation mechanism on the order of 500 gigavolt per meter. And so these are enormous fields. Again, in conventional accelerators, it's 10 to 100 megavolt. So if you drive up the 
the power of the laser a little bit more. This is sort of the sequence. You have your little plasma, little electrons, little ions. Laser comes in. It does its snow plow thing. Electrons get blown out. The ions are left unshielded. And then these ions pull these electrons all back over here. And now you have a region with very dense electrons and ions. And so this is your electric field that co-propagates. And this regime where you've actually blown out all the electrons, we call that the blowout or bubble regime. You've sort of created a little bubble inside this plasma. So once you have this field, when you think again about this, these, these ocean waves or, or this motorboat, you can see here that we've, we, we have an, an ocean wave which is so large that it curls back on itself. If you look at an ocean wave that is a small amplitude, the water just bobs up and down. Those that have surfed, if you don't paddle and an ocean wave come by, come, comes by you, you just bob up and down. You don't go forward. But all this here, this white spray, actually does go forward. This is the water that's breaking and it, it moves forward. So if you're a surfer, and this is actually in the bay, <laughs> you could catch this wave and actually ride this wave. And my kids thought this was a good line to put on there. It's a hot day. Why aren't we all out there trying this? So, um, but that's sort of the basic idea. We, we're going to plant electrons on these waves. This shows a movie from our colleagues at UCLA where you see this laser pulse propagating in the plasma. And so this guy here is a laser pulse. It has blown out this bubble. And here you see little electrons getting trapped in these electric fields and they get accelerated. And so this is sort of a nice little movie, you see an electron beam right there and another one right there. This regime is the regime that we currently do our experiments in, in this blowout regime. It's not the ideal regime and I'll talk about that. It does produce very high gradients. It can produce narrow energy spread beams that I'll talk about, but you don't really have much of control. And so a lot of my talk will go on discussing what we have done and then how go we, how go we are we going to go about making a device that's really reliable, that is um, controllable, and that works well for positrons? So this is where we go. So let me say a few words about a laser. What type of laser do we use? In our research here at Berkeley, we use a near-infrared titanium sapphire laser. What does near-infrared mean? It's about 800 nanometer. You would not see it with your eyes. This radiation, if you look at the visible spectrum, we're operating about right here. This is red, this is dark blue, this is ultraviolet. So we're infrared laser. Second thing that's sort of typical is that it's very short pulse. And I'll tell you in a second what femtoseconds means for those that don't do this every day. But they're very, very short pulses. The peak power is also enormous. It's 10 to 60 terawatt on our present systems. And I'll tell you in a second what this means. It fires at about 10 shots a second. And we focus all of this power down to a small spot so that we get intensities fired on this plasma, which are 10 to the 18th to 10 to the 19 watts per square centimeter. For comparison, the intensity of the sun on a sunny day is about 0.1 watt per square centimeter. So it's huge intensity that we produce with our laser. So a little bit on, on units. I know this is a mixed audience, so I decided, okay, one terawatt, what does it mean? Abbreviation is one TW. It's a thousand billion watt. And modern lasers are now reaching this here, petawatt, a thousand terawatt. We, as I said, use between 10 and 100 terawatt, and we're moving towards the petawatt. And if you compare this peak power, just to get a sense of it, the world consumption in 2005 is about 13 to 14 terawatt. Now, this is every second. So, of course, we, we play a trick. And I'll, I'll tell you, how do we produce so much peak power if the whole, whole world produces 13 to 14 terawatt? The trick, of course, is that power equals to energy over duration in which this energy arrives. And as I said, we use something on the order of 50 femtoseconds or even shorter. And a femtosecond is one FS, is zero point, all these zero, and then one second. So you only need to get a half a joule in 50 femtoseconds to get 10 terawatts. 
One Belgian chocolate bar represents three megajoules of chemical energy. So this is really not that much if when you think about it. What is a femtosecond? If you think about light traveling from the moon to the earth, it takes about 1.2 seconds. For our 50, 50 femtosecond pulse, it's about one third, it, it, it does this, this, this uh, um, sorry, this distance it travels in about 150 femtoseconds. This is a human hair, so it's about a third of the distance of a human hair that it would travel in 50 femtoseconds. So that gives you sort of a sense of all of these numbers. So they're really incredible numbers. So how do we do it? How do we get half a joule packed into 50 femtoseconds? And this was a very important breakthrough in a, for our field because without this, we wouldn't be doing what we are doing today. The technique of packing all of this energy into these short pulses is called chirp pulse amplification and was written up in 1985, so about six years after the first paper in our field on laser wake field acceleration. So talk about visionary. Uh, this technology wasn't around yet when the idea of laser wake field was, was being pushed. So the way our lasers work is you start with a very short pulse oscillator. And short, I mean something on the order of 10 femtoseconds or so. You stretch this out in time using what we call a dispersive delay line. It's a trick to make sure that all these colors that make up this short pulse all have different uh, um, times of propagation, just like sort of race cars in a NASCAR race. They first start all together, and then they can kind of stack one behind the other. That's what we do, we're doing here. Then we amplify this laser pulse by something on the order of 9 to 10 orders of magnitude, so about a billion to 10 billion times more powerful. And then we recompress all of this energy back into this sh short little pulse. And that's how we, how we do it. Here's an example that we have here at Berkeley Lab. We have three amplifiers. We call them Godzilla, Chihuahua, and T-Rex. And these are the workhorses in Building 71. If you're interested in visiting this, you're always welcome to see these lasers. We have one that runs at about 10 to 15 terawatt another one that can reach up to 10 terawatt, and then this one, T-Rex, runs up to about 60 terawatts uh, in, a, in a single pulse. So this, this is our work tool. So now, back to the, the laser accelerator. As I said, the particle energy is the electric field times the distance over which this electric field works on this particle. So this is, the, I think, about the only equation in my talk. Typical experimental setup pre-2003, what were we doing? We take this Godzilla beam or Chihuahua beam and you focus it with a specially curved optic onto this little gas jet here. And a gas jet is just a source of supersonic gas. The gas stays nicely together as it expands from this little nozzle. You can see this, this is our gas jet here. Out comes a plume of gas and then we hit it with the laser pulse and again, we hit it with 10 to the 18th to 10 to the 19 watts per square centimeter. So this gas quickly turns into a plasma. And then the laser acts on this plasma. And when you do things right, you get out an electron beam. You measure this electron beam with an integrating current transformer. This is just to measure the amount of charge. You deflect it with a little magnet for the, measuring the energy spread in these beams onto a phosphor screen. And you look at it. And before we really knew what we were doing. This is the typical electron spectrum that we used to get pre-2004. What I'm showing you here is the number of electrons at a given energy versus energy. Those of us that had a bigger laser, this guy went out a little bit from 50 MeV up to maybe 100 or 200 MeV. But everybody was seeing these distributions that sort of looked like this. And so we had electrons at a few MeV and some at 50 MeV in only about a two to three millimeter distance. So it did tell us that the fields were there, that these particles were getting accelerated, but that we weren't doing things right in, in this experiment. So being at an accelerator lab, we adopted the following philosophy. Let's think about how does a conventional accelerator work. A conventional accelerator works with a power source, radio frequency source. It works with a structure, a copper structure. And the RF waves come into the copper structure and build up fields, electrostatic fields in this structure, 
or fields that are at least capable of accelerating particles. And then you have a gun. And the gun shoots electrons into this field at the right phase, and it accelerates this. So our approach at Berkeley here was, let's use the same paradigm to build a plasma-based accelerator. We are going to build a structure that will hold the power, a plasma-based structure. We use the laser as the power source, and then somehow we have to get those surfers. If you remember earlier on, if you fall asleep, you dream about surfers on waves. You will get a lot about my talk. So you get, have to get these surfers in there. So let's talk a little bit about this structure here. How do we make a structure that can transport this laser beam and at the same time be suitable for acceleration? So before I get there, and this is sort of a very important slide, although there's only a few words on it. If you decide to make a structure, you have to decide how long am I going to make it and how should it look like? So we call it the 3Ds of laser accelerators. The fraction of the laser pulse, the phasing of the particle with the wave, and depletion of the laser power, and I'll first cover these two here. What do these words mean? So, um, first of all, how do you make a little optical fiber? So you have to, when you focus a laser pulse into this plasma, you focus this stuff tightly. And so when you do this focusing, of course the laser will expand again or diffract out, and even though your accelerator, your, your every, you have every intention to make it long. If your pulse is, laser pulse is tightly focused, it will expand rapidly. So you have to come up with a way of confining that laser pulse over an extended distance. And so you have to build the same as an, an optical fiber, but an optical fiber that can handle 10 to the 18th to 10 to the 19 watts per square centimeter. So you could grab your little glass fiber and shoot this laser pulse at it, you'll get a single shot accelerator. The fiber will blow up, and that's not, clearly not the way to do it. So how do you make a little fiber that will beat this diffraction issue? So the first thing is, you produce your little plasma, and this is it right there. The second thing you'll do is you're going to heat this little plasma. And what does this heating do? It makes a hot little filament of plasma, which then you have to wait a little bit, and you allow this filament of plasma to explode. Because it's so hot, you have a lot of thermal pressure, and it will explode. And you form a density profile that looks like this here, a minimum of plasma on axis, maximum off axis, and this is ex exactly the right properties for an optical fiber. So this is sort of the basis, and this is what we did in the, for the 2004 work in, in Nature. The other technique that I'll talk about is with a discharge-based waveguide where you can, again, produce the same profile but with a slightly different technique. So you have your little optical fiber to beat diffraction. Does this work? Yes. This was work from Cameron Geddes' PhD dissertation. It's a busy plot here, but the first thing is we ionize the little gas jet. We heat it with another laser beam. And then we come in with our drive beam at the right spot. Does this work as a fiber? You bet. You look at the laser beam right at the input there with a little CCD camera. And remember, this is 7, 10 to the 18 watts per square centimeter. This is what the input looks like of our laser beam. If you don't apply the optical fiber, and you look over here, 2 millimeters away, this is what the laser beam looks like. If you turn on the plasma, but you don't turn on any of these shaping beams, we call them, the igniter beam and the heater beam, and you just fire the laser beam at it, it diffuses the laser, laser pulse. And when you turn the channel on, here is your little laser beam coming out. So this is a very important building block for our laser accelerator. This is our version of this structure, which is akin to the, to the copper structure of the RF accelerators. Second piece of physics is dephasing. Now you have your little fiber and you're shooting the, the, the laser pulse into it and you're exciting this electric field that I talked about. If you remember the picture of the surfer on the wave, if the surfer starts at the top of the wave, it starts, he or she starts sliding down. And then if you imagine having another wave right here, 
the surfer will s slow down again. And that is because the surfer, which is starting right there, slides down. You can see it right there. And then if you allow these surfers to continue on, they will either end up in the propeller of the motorboat or in the crest ahead of them, and they'll slow down again. We call this the dephasing or a particle outrunning the wave. So if you would continue this here, they would all decelerate again. And so this is a very important concept. The scale length for this process to happen, this surfer sliding down and then going back up, the scale length for this is set by the density that you choose of the plasma. Why? Because the density controls the speed of the motorboat. The faster your motorboat, the faster this wave will travel, the, the harder it will be for the surfer to outrun this wave. So when you plug in numbers, I guess I lied, we have another equation here. You see energy gain, scales like the intensity of your laser divided by the density of your plasma. Your field goes up with density, but this length here increases with density, and so you want to, sorry, uh, decreases with density. So you want to reduce your plasma density to beat this effect, which would limit otherwise the energy of your particle. And this is what we saw back in 2004. This is the electron beam on a phosphor without this channel. And this is the energy distribution that we talked about a few slides ago. This is the energy distribution of the electron beam with the fiber. And this is what this electron beam looks like on a phosphor screen. So a very dramatic difference. So now, a little movie. This is a move that Cameron made with help from, from folks at TechX Corporations. It kind of will summarize all these processes. You have the laser right there. It forms this density wave right here. The wave will build up and become large enough to start trapping electrons. There they go. They get accelerated. They're still running ahead. And here they're starting to slow down and they're curling around. So we terminate our accelerator right there that they're all at the peak energy and all nicely bunched. And that's sort of the key physics. So now, how do you go to higher energy? Because I told you that our experiments were sort of at the 100 MeV level, 100 million volt. How do we get to a billion volt? Well, you have to make the laser travel faster. Per this equation here, you get bigger energy gain if you drop the density. And so we switched technologies. We, we teamed up with Oxford University and one of the students who was on this, in this group in Oxford University is Tony Gonzalez. He's now a postdoc here. They built this little discharge system, which I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about. And we built this bigger T-Rex laser system. So how, do, how, how does this plasma work? You take a sapphire block, a piece of sapphire, and then you take your laser and you machine with a low power laser, you machine little grooves in the sapphire here. Right, one here and a couple right there. These you will use to let gas in. This one is the one that you'll shoot the laser beam in. And you make two of these pieces. You go to the microscope, grab a bottle of crazy glue, and glue these two halves together. Now you apply two electrodes, high voltage. You pull a current through this. The current heats the middle of the plasma. And you see where I'm headed? You get a hot plasma. It expands, and it forms, again, a lower density on the middle. You, again, have your little tube to guide the laser pulse, your little optical fiber. Then we built a large spectrometer. This is our little accelerator right here. This is typically a couple centimeters. Our magnet dwarfs our little accelerator. And this was part of another student's PhD work, Kei Nakamura. He built a spectrometer that allowed us in a single shot to see everything from 30 million volt all the way out to 1.1 billion volt or 1 GeV on a little phosphor screen that we look at with, with CCD cameras. And what did we see? After a lot of putzing around, we got a nice GeV beam coming out with about 40 terawatt. This is 30 MeV. This is 1 GeV, and we got a nice little beam coming out. And then we did some simulations. This is just to tell you that we do simulations, that we compare this with experiments, and we got good agreement. So we have about a 1.1 GV beam now, 
with this amount of charge and with a couple percent energy spread. So this is a far cry from this 100% energy spread distribution that you saw in a couple earlier slides. And these are well-behaved beams. If we run the laser power down a little bit, we choose another diameter capillary. This is about 200 micron diameter capillary. We got a nice beam out at about half a GeV or 500 MeV. And so we're very happy with this type of beams. So if I summarize sort of the progress that we've made, we started in 95 with the Lasers Optical Accelerator Systems Integrated Studies Group, developed these little optical fibers, got enough electrons out to do radioisotopes, got the so-called Dream Beam in 2004, the GV Beam in 2006, and now we're marching towards 10 GeV. Some of the applications before I, I tell you about our 10 GeV plans. Obviously, these bunches have very unique properties. They're very ultra short, as I said, femtoseconds. They're intrinsically synchronized with laser pulses. And so this offers a couple applications. I'll talk mainly about these ones here. But you could shoot this electron beam right through a sample, a ferromagnet, and use the very strong B fields or magnetic fields from this bunch to look at switching in these ferromagnets. Why is this important? We all use chips, we all use memories. There's magnetic switching going on. How fast could you actually switch this material? Our bunches could actually be used to look at this. Our interest to date is radiation sources. And this is the, the spectrum ranging from radio waves all the way out to x-rays. And I'll tell you a little bit about what we call terahertz, sort of long wavelength radiation that we produce and then our work towards getting hard x-rays out. The long wavelength is easy. It almost comes for free. When you shoot a laser beam into this gas jet, you get a little electron beam come out. When it comes out, it produces at the same time a little coherent terahertz pulse. And this was the PhD thesis of Jeroen van Tilburg, who was also in the group, who's now a postdoc at the Chemical Science Division. And I don't have much time to talk about it, but we have Guillaume Plateau, another student in the group, and Nicholas Matla is a postdoc in the group. And they now achieved about four microjoules of energy, which are equivalent to fields with our technique, which are about an order of magnitude compared to conventional systems. And so we're very excited about this. And if anybody wants to use our terahertz, come and see us. The second one that we want to do is build an FEL, a free electron laser. So we have the laser beam comes into our accelerator, we get this little electron beam, and we send it through a series of magnets that make this electron beam wiggle. Every time it wiggles, it emits a burst of radiation. And when you do things right, you can get all of this radiation phased in such a way that our calculations indicate we should get a large number of photons per pulse, something on the order of 10 to the 13th photons per pulse, in the XUV. Very, very challenging experiment because we're not quite there in terms of energy spread of our bunches. We need to go down about a factor of 10 in energy spread. And so we have our work cut out. And I'll talk a little bit about how we plan to do this. Kim Robinson and the engineering division got us the series of magnets. And we have a graduate student working on this, Mike Bakeman from University of Nevada, Reno. It's being measured as we speak in building 77. And here you see the one section of this little undulator with a magnetic probe. This will go into our beam line and we'll shoot our electron beam through it. But the big question is, do we really have the quality of the bunches? So I'm back to my roadmap for the conventional accelerator. I talked about the optical fiber. Let me say a few words about injection. How do we make sure that when you generate that wave, you put the surfers at the right location on the wave rather than having this tsunami roll through your plasma and it just grabs whatever and shoots it out of the, of the machine. You have some parameters. You can play with the plasma density, the laser power, et cetera. And as I showed you, we did get good quality beams out of it. But we're looking for a way to get a little controlled injector in there. And so that's this, this part here. So coming back to these surfers, these were the self-injected water. We're looking at these guys. This is what we want to do. 
And you want to be careful in this game, otherwise you end up like this guy, <laughs> totally injected out of phase. So we want to be careful because this, the analogy is this is lousy beams and these are good beams. So this is what we're hoping to do. It turns out that there's a neat technique, and we just published a, a Fizerev letter on this, where instead of tailoring your plasma in the radial direction, making this little tube, you're now going to play with the longitudinal direction of your plasma structure and put a little bump on it. It turns out that right at that little bump, when you focus a laser beam on it, it's pretty easy to get electrons to, gra to, to come out of, the, of, of this plasma or get liberated, if you wish, and get accelerated to a low energy. So we will take electrons that sort of get born right there and then accelerate them in this structure right here. So we call this our integrated structure, our first staging. Little injector coupled with the accelerator structure. We get increased control and stability, and our hope is to get well below a percent energy spread. Is this fiction? No. Cameron and others did an experiment on it, a proof of principle experiment, on just getting this, what we call this local wave breaking to work, or this down ramp injection. And this is what we observed in our experiment. A nice little stable beam at about one million volts. So how do I get to a GEV? You now grab this one MEV beam, and you're going to put that into your little channel, all closely coupled. The nice thing is that our simulations indicate that this one MeV beam, it has about 170 kilovolt energy spread. But this energy spread stays frozen in, so when you bring up this beam from one MeV to one billion volts, you're now dividing this number by a factor of 1,000, so you go from 10% energy spread to something well below a percent energy spread. And so we're, this is the, 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 the game that we're playing right now. We've already done the first little test this is Tony Gonzalez and Dmitry Panasenko and Kei Nakamura are working on this. And you see this one little MEV beam coming out of this device. And we have now have a really neat structure. A laser pulse comes into the little capillary. This is the sapphire block. Again, this is all stuff that you hold in your hand. So this is a GV accelerator that you hold in your hand. So right there, this little line is where the gas comes in. This little thing here, the blow up, is shown here. This is a jet machined by Shaolin. She's another graduate student in the group. This is laser machined inside the sapphire. And this is basically the little bump that we'll put onto the structure, get our electrons born right there, and then the rest of the structure is the accelerator. And so this is our hope that in the next months to come, we will have this working as a nice little stage accelerator one to two GV coming out. A GV normally, I should have said this, a GV conventional accelerator is on the order of 60 meters long. And so this is just something, if you come to the lab, I'll show it to you. It's a really neat little device. You see a picture of it right there. So how about a collider? In the remaining time, let's go really science fiction now. But we are actually science fiction buffs, so we take this stuff serious. So put all your prejudices aside, and let's dream together on how we build a collider. So we're working on this little part here, little injector, little capillary structure. And I hope I'm convincing you that we're starting to make headway on this. And so now the rest is simple. You use the PowerPoint magic of chaining these things together. And you do the same with a 10 Jeff module, shoot it into something, get positrons out, and you run these accelerators in such a regime that they can accelerate both electrons and positrons. And this has already been shown in experiments at SLAC that you can accelerate positrons. Our regime is a little bit different. But anyway, so let's, let's look into would this be doable. So we have to figure out how do you actually do chain these things together? How do you control them? How do you get a positron source and a electron source that's compatible with all of this femtosecond micron st style structures and plasmas, how we do, do, do we control what we call the emittance, sort of the divergence and the, the quality of this electron beam and the energy spread? And last but not least, what is happening on these laser power uh, sources? Will they, will they have enough power 
to power a large machine like this here for a collider. So lots of challenges, and I'll talk a little bit about it. I've already told you a little bit about this injector. I'll tell you a little bit about our plans on making these multi-GV beams. We have a very significant simulation program um, with Cameron Geddes, Eric Essary, Carl Schroeder, TechX Corporation, and others, and then, of course, the big laser. So multi-step program. Step one, we've done this. We can do GV in much less than five centimeters. I've shown you results on this. Step two is in progress. This idea of staging these two things with a controlled little injector to get few GV in just a couple centimeters. Step three, we need a bigger laser. And we call it the Bella laser, and I'll tell you what this means. So we're, we're, we want to build a 30 to 60 centimeter section of capillary, about a thousand terawatt laser pulse that we shoot in, and we expect, according to our simulation, something on the order of 10 GV to come out in a distance like this. At slack, this takes about 600 meters. Step four, we chain them together. So our little building block, and we chain them together. So I don't want to be flippant about this chaining together because this is one of the core issues of our field right now. Suppose I, we do this 10 GeV LINAC. What happens is when this laser pulse drives this little LINAC, at the end, it has run out of energy. So if you think again about these copper structure, structures with the klystrons, every so often you have another klystron. So what is our game plan here? You could say, okay, I'll put another structure over here, and then I'm going to bring in another laser beam right here, which is about 40 joules, terawatt beam, but you need a large enough beam on this optic, otherwise you will blow up this optic on the first shot. The power on this optic is so large if you want to make this short that it won't sustain this, this high intensity. So we decided, being nonconformists at Berkeley, let's blow it up every shot. <laughs> so how do we blow up a mirror every shot when these things are expensive? Well, Dmitry Panasenko and Anthony Shu, who's uh, Dmitry is a postdoc and Anthony is an undergraduate uh, senior at UC Berkeley, are working on a ultra-thin liquid sheet, water, that we shoot a laser on. When the laser is focused on this water, it turns it into plasma. When the plasma is dense enough, this little surface right there becomes a mirror. And so you shoot your high peak power laser onto this, turn it into a mirror, and whoop, you have your next section powered. The water, of course, gets flushed through. By the time the next laser pulse on, comes in, you have a fresh mirror. And so this sounds, again, like an incredible challenge. It is, but we have experiments that, that are starting on this concept. The second one is what I like to call the freeway on-ramp. First laser pulse, and then a curved capillary to bring in the next laser pulse. And so this is another concept that we are working on. This is the layout for all of this staging to show you that this is real. This is with help of the engineering division, Rob Duarte, Don Seversuit, and others. And there you see our concept for the little staged accelerator right there. So BELLA, what is BELLA? BELLA stands for the Berkeley Lab Laser Accelerator. And this is a big project. In a week and a half, a few of us, five of us, will be up in Germantown to defend this project. And we hope we will be successful. It's about a $25 million project to get this bigger laser, bigger experimental area. And then all of this basic research that we're doing on diagnostics, staging, terahertz, and et cetera. And this sort of forms our Bella project. It will take place in Building 71. Our current new cave is over here. The laser is actually over in this area. This is the laser bay for our petawatt system, which will run at one hertz. It will be the world's highest rep rate petawatt class laser system that we want to buy commercially. And this is a revolution that laser companies are now capable of building these things so that we can concentrate on the plasma physics and accelerator science, and somebody else builds this laser for us. 
Laser comes out, gets focused, and right there is the accelerator in this here. The high lag for those that are old timers, the super high lag in building 71 got taken out. The building is now seismically safe again, and so we're looking forward to getting this experiment on, on the run. So a word about lasers, and that's my next to last slide. A laser needs to get enough power into this collider structure that we're trying to build. And so you have to start thinking about how will they deliver enough average power. We know we can do peak power, and we need it with enough efficiency. So when you think about what a laser is, it's an amplifier material and a pump source. And even in this area, there's major breakthroughs, and one of them that I like particularly is in the amplifier materials. There's now work going on on making lasers out of ceramics. You don't grow a crystal anymore, but you bake your amplifier into an oven with ceramics. And at Livermore, they've demonstrated, even though it's only a frac of about a half a second, but they've demonstrated using these ceramic materials about a 67 kilowatt average power laser system. This is still a far cry from what we need for a collider, but it's getting there. And Steve Chu pointed out to me that for pump source, more and more lasers are starting to use diodes because they're very efficient and they have low thermal load. And Steve pointed out that the diode market is going to undergo a real transition because more and more street lights will be replaced with diodes. Once these diodes get developed, we will be able to benefit from the, the development package that goes into making these high efficiency street lamps and use them hopefully into the laser technology that we will need for a collider. So we hope that these high energy, multi kilohertz, high rep rate systems will become available once all of this matures in parallel to the track that we are following. And I'd like to end with the same slide that I began but with a different caption. And this is from George Bernard Shaw. People who say it cannot be done should not interrupt those who are doing it. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Bill. That's great. Thanks a lot. So we have about 10 minutes for questions. And uh, I'm going to try to get this uh, microphone to you so that you can put your question into the mic. Who's got the first? Question. Hi, could you please say more about the role of supercomputer simulation in this field? And in particular, if you had access to a much more powerful machine, what kind of science about laser wake field would you learn? Very good question. This is very, very important. Right now, the simulation with the, the nice little movie uh, that Cameron did with others, uh, typically for a GV module, takes about 500,000 hours on today's supercomputers. 500,000? Yes. In addition, you need to do all your benchmarking runs, and so pretty soon you're talking about a close to a million hours on a parallel machine. We would love to do a full-scale TENGEF simulation of our module for Bella, but we can't, so we have to scale parameters into a regime that becomes doable with current technology. Our dream is that if we would have the computers in the control room to get much faster feedback on what the experiment is actually seeing. And so the development of faster machines, of better algorithms, of, of better techniques to deal with these plasma uh, problems would be an incredible boost to our field. The, the, the issue is the plasma wavelength that we want to use is typically on a 100 micron scale. The laser wavelength is on the order of 0.8 micron, and we need to resolve these laser wavelengths within the 100 micron. So the number of little cells that you need in your grid to simulate this is just enormous. And then you need a lot of particles to get accurate results. And so this is a very major endeavor. Thank you for uh, good presentations. I have one uh, interesting question here. In slide 26, uh, you presented the energy spread uh, around 10% or something like that. I think you, this energy spread is limiting your beam accelerations. Are, are you thinking anything how to guide the beam 
uh, how to control the energy spread. How to control the energy spread? Right. Yes, so for the control of the energy spread, our current model is separate out the injection process and the acceleration process. So in our experiments to date, you shoot a laser pulse in into this little waveguide. You generate the plasma wave. The plasma wave builds up and traps background electrons, whether you like it or not, if you run at a high power level. You can, of course, back down in power, and then you won't get the self-trapping. But our, our idea is get this little high-density section as the injector. You, you create the electrons that are fast enough, just like surfers on the wave. If you, if you don't paddle, you will bob up and down. You need to have enough momentum to catch the wave. So our little 1 MeV injector, we inject that into our plasma structure. The 1 MeV beam has 10% energy spread. But you bring it up to 1 billion volts, so you divide that 10% by 1,000. And so now you're talking about much less than a percent. So that's our concept. Uh, instead of using uh, your machine for a collider, um, do you think you could have enough current and a narrow enough energy spread for a free electron laser source that would uh, beat what's happening at LCLS and other places? Yeah, so the, our first step is to, to do the lasing. The, the, the shorter the wavelength at which you want to laze, the higher your beam energy needs to be, and the lower the energy spread needs to be. So we have picked a starting point for studying the possibility of, of doing in a free electron laser with our current half GV beam. So with half GV and the undulator that we got from Boeing Corporation, we expect to see 30 nanometer radiation. But for it to really laze, we need to reduce our energy spread by about a factor of 10. The peak current in our device is incredible. It's on the order of five to 10 kilo amperes easily. Because our bunches are so short, they're only a few five femtoseconds, and we pack a lot of charge in that five femtoseconds. So once our, our staging works with injector and accelerator, we expect the energy spread to go down. We get Bella online, we bring it up to 10 GeV, now we can start going down to shorter wavelengths. And um, then we'll be, if everything works out, we, we potentially could have a machine that is competitive in terms of uh, brilliance to the LCLS at lower rep rates and probably, um, um, well, no, lower rep rate. So that's the, that's, it, it's a number of years out. We have to first get the accelerator a little bit better under control, get the energy up. But we, we definitely see that as a, as a very strong application ahead of when the collider application is ready, obviously. Wim, uh, how long would that, how big would that, uh, that kind of a machine be as compared to a linear accelerator now? So if you look at the, the layout for the, the 10 Jeff, let me pull that back up. So right here. So this, the accelerator itself is, we expect only about a half a meter. The length of the device itself is dictated by the choice of optics that we have available to date. We need a spot size in here of about 100 micron for the laser, so fairly big spot size. So if you want to loosely focus your laser beam, you need a fairly large F number optic. For those that are used cameras, you know what an F number is. So you need a fairly large F number. Um, that means we need a long focal length and we need a large enough optic in, the, in, in here to make sure that we can handle the laser peak power. If coatings become better on, on laser optics, we could shrink this distance. We could run with a smaller laser beam on here, go to a shorter focal length, and shrink this whole distance down. So it's not the accelerator that's driving the distance in this case. It's the availability of the coatings on the optics. And so this is about 
an eight meter distance and we have another eight meter until our diagnostics. A 10 Jeff Linac conventionally six football fields. So it's still a far cry from, although it's, you could argue, well, we need 20 meters for the whole cave, but it's 20 meters compared to 600 meters. So you're getting close to a tabletop. Huh? It's, this <laughs> is on a table, right there. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for coming today. <laughs> Thanks, Wim.